Happy New Year. And no matter what sacred space you find yourself in this morning, I hope that it is full of nourishing celebration and deep, deep love and commitment. If you're the sort of person, which I am not, that makes New Year's resolutions, well, congratulations on day one. So far, you've made it however many hours you have in. The research on this, according to Forbes and others, is that, well, the truth of the matter is, as most of us probably already know, New Year's resolutions, they don't typically last. Within the first week, about 25% have already disappeared. If you go out to MLK Day, if you go out to the end of January, by the time we get to Valentine's Day, most of our resolutions have fallen off. What I do instead of New Year's resolutions is I have New Year's reflections. And for New Year's reflections, I try not just to keep the day, but a season and even a lifestyle. New Year's resolutions are not, in fact, new. They started, the best that we can tell, according to history.com, about 4,000 years ago with the Babylonians. They continued into the Roman period with uh, Emperor Caesar, who changed the calendar. The Babylonians' New Year started in March during the planting season. When I lived in India, New Year's Day, in one year, I celebrated no less than six different New Year celebrations throughout the calendar. Caesar shifted it to January 1st with the god Janus, looking forward, looking back, the two-faced deity. In 1740, John Wesley began the practice of watch night, of contemplating how it is we would enter into the new year. And so even then, it became a sacred tradition within the wisdom tradition of Christianity. Still, I don't find New Year's resolutions to be helpful. In fact, I sometimes have found them to be unhelpful because they simply become marking points for an annual ritual of failure. And once we've got that narrative moving inside of us, it becomes an easy self-replicating cycle. But a period of reflection invites me to come back again and again and again to center my life on what matters to me. And as we would say in our sacred tradition, to again ask myself, if I am incarnating those deepest core values. Most of our resolutions, as you might well imagine, are made around some sort of self-improvement and some sort of relational improvement. I think those two go together. And whenever we're talking about relationships, we're ultimately talking about the quality of our attachment. Attachment simply means the emotional bonds we have with each other. Our paired attachment, our communal attachment, no matter how big or small we draw that circle. The community of church, the community of our neighborhoods, the community of our nation, the community of the globe. And I think healthy emotional bonds of attachment find their surest, safest, most stable grounding in two previous points, agency and authenticity. From a place of agency and authenticity, we form or are able to form safe, secure, stable attachments. And then we have something to reflect upon. Agency is the position of choice. Agency, as I define it, is the permission that rises from within. Agency is not externalized permission where we give our permission away to some person or some other group. Agency is the permission that rises from within. Agency is the full range of yes, no, maybe, with multiple flavors 
in between. From a position of agency, choice, permission rising from within, then I am able to be authentic. Authentic is that safe, secure, stable attachment to self. Right here, I want to be clear. What I am not talking about. I am specifically not talking about a program, a means, a mechanism of how to be a hyper-individual. I happen to believe that one of the forces that is most destructive in our relationships, in our communities, again, no matter how large or small you draw the circle, is, to is toxic hyper-individualism. This, I can make it, I can do it on my own. My needs override the needs of the many. The needs to be myself overrides the needs of a community. Authenticity, in my opinion, is being who I am with neither aggression nor apology. Meaning, I do not need you to be me. I am who I am without aggression, without attempting to make people think the way I think or act the way I act or choose the way I choose. I am also who I am without apology. I do not measure myself against anyone else's standards, but against who I am and how I continue to understand myself. And as most of us probably know, that's a lifelong process. Agency, permission arising from within, authenticity being who I am with neither aggression nor apology, these two things then form safe, secure, stable attachment, emotional bonds with each other. When I'm teaching this, I don't actually draw these on a line. I draw them in a circle because they feed off of each other and it becomes an energy wheel as it's spinning round and round. In attachment theory, it's called the dependency paradox. What the dependency paradox is, is that we need each other in safe, stable, secure, co-regulating relationships in order, in fact, to have self-regulation. In other words, we need each other. It is, in fact, I believe, a biological imperative. I'm even willing to say it's a spiritual imperative. What a biological imperative means is that we do not thrive and often do not thrive to survive without each other. To state the obvious, we are social mammals. We belong in community. Agency, then, also requires discernment. And this is the invitation that I'm inviting you into on this New Year's Day. And that is, what are your yes, no's, and maybe? What are they for you as an individual? What are they in any relationships you are in? What are they for your community? And I'm inviting you into deep and repeated reflection on this. So what is calling you to a yes. What is calling you to big, bold action or even quiet, subtle determination? In our tradition, we ask about what is it you're being called to incarnate as we come through Advent in this Christmas season. What, what is your yes that if you were to sacrifice for it, at the end, you would say, I have something worth sacrificing for. What is it that you want to resource, that you want to choose over other things? What is calling you to yes? Yes is not the only language of affirmation. I'll say that again. 
yes is not the only language of affirmation. No can be an affirmation as well. What, this is my second question, what is calling you to an affirming no? What are you carrying right now that needs to be laid down, either for its own sake, it's something with which you are finished, you are done, or it is something that you need to lay down in order to live into, to more fully embody the yes that is calling you. What is your yes? What is your affirming no? Yes and no are not the only two languages of affirmation either. There is the gracious space of maybe. Maybe is the I don't know yet. Maybe is the I need more time. Maybe is I need a few more breaths. Maybe is a space that can go yes or no, but its season maybe has not yet arrived. What is your yes? What is your no? And on this New Year's Day, when you don't have to have everything figured out, you don't have to make a resolution, the call is to reflection. What is the grace space of maybe? What if 2023 were a year of personal and communal discernment? What if as we start this New Year's Day together, we committed ourselves not to resolutions that we may or may not live up to, not to patterns that may simply reinforce in us shame-based behavior or doing things the way we have always done them or not doing them the way we have is simply reaction. But we were called into a deep space of personal and communal reflection, of discernment, discernment towards embodiment, toward incarnation, so that as we came again to Advent next year, as we came through Christmas and arrived at the dawn of yet another new year, we would say that our yes, our no, our maybes were worth it. And in fact, we're guided by the lights we've celebrated this Advent season of hope, of peace, of joy, of love, shepherding us through whatever may come. Thanks be. Amen.